uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks especially for coming to the room. It's so hard to talk to these big groups when you can't see everybody. But uh, if you don't mind, I will be sitting for today because I am massively pregnant and also I don't want to get in the way of your view of the slides. So today we're going to be talking about uh, cannabis legalization and environmental health, which is a little bit of a, a different uh, conversation that's currently being had across Canada right now. Um, just to give you an update on the current state of cannabis legalization, this is kind of the timeline that everybody's on track to follow. Uh, starting with the federal legislation appearing in April 2017, both provinces have now finished their stakeholder consultation, they've developed their frameworks, they're in review, and they are at the point of tabling uh, legislation for their provinces and territories. And so after that point, we're going into the implementation of the education phase. And uh, finally, legalization will theoretically happen maybe sometime this year unless the Senate decides to sit on this for however long they want and then we all get extra more extra time. Uh, folks, if I can get you to mute your lines, that would be super helpful. Somebody's got their line unmuted and it would be great if you could uh, shut that down. Come on guys, so, sort it um, out. <laughs> Sassy people on the line today. All right, so another thing that's happening right now is that Health Canada has put out their um, proposed approach to the regulation of cannabis, which is a consultation document for their public consultation on the regulations that will support the Act. So uh, that consultation is open until January 20th, and uh, it's a very interesting process because we'll see eventually what regulations are settled on, whether or not that affects anything at the provincial territorial level. Don't know. Also right now, Health Canada is uh, developing their public education and risk communication strategies, and those are actually going to be focus tested, focus group tested soon across Canada. <clears throat> so there's a lot of things going on. This is like just like a little snapshot. So the reason why I bring up um, risk messaging is because NCCH has a, an interest in risk communication for cannabis. Um, the major themes that we see for most of the risk communication campaigns across Canada, Health Canada, CPHA, Provincial Territorial, they focus on the major themes like addiction, uh, youth and cognitive <coughs> development, uh, mental health, motor vehicle accidents is obviously a really big one, and uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding. So some companies or like the, the industry in the U.S. is now actually promoting cannabis as a, an all-natural option for uh, morning sickness because you know your only other option is thalidomide, so you might as well take cannabis. It's just really quite crazy. But uh, yeah, so those are kind of like the major things. <coughs> and these are all very high level public health issues that may or may not become a problem over time. And so it really requires a major public health effort for us to get surveillance in place and research and uh, be ready to respond to that. However, what I notice when I look at these themes is that they have nothing about the environmental health risks. Okay, and so the reason why this is important is that in the United States and other places where they've legalized, some of these environmental health risks are the immediate risks that have to be responded to right away. So these are things like um, pesticide contamination and hash oil explosions, which are just two things and we'll be talking about more today. One of the things about this not having <laughs> my full lung capacity is I tend to run out of breath, so I'm sorry for that. So today what we're going to be talking about is the environmental health risks of legalization. So there's kind of three framing questions we need to consider. The first one is um, like what are these environmental health hazards that are associated with the, the <laughs> phases of cannabis? So there's a cultivation phase, there's a processing phase, and then there's of course use. Um, the next question is um, because many of the environmental health risks actually focus around cultivation, we have to ask ourselves, how will legalization affect the extent, scale, and conditions under which cannabis is cultivated? So right now in Canada, we have obviously a lot of illicit cultivation, and that is going to become legitimized, and we'll have um, the medical, medical commercial cultivation and personal recreational uh, cultivation, as well as commercial recreational cultivation. So there's going to be cultivation at many different scales and in many different settings. Uh, and then finally, looking at what measures can be implemented to reduce exposures in all phases. So these are, these are the phases, cultivation, processing, and use. Today's talk focuses on the purple stuff, mostly. I'm going to totally skim over the other stuff because the cultivation uh, aspect is really where most of our work focuses. And in fact, we have, I'll be talking about this later, but we have a paper coming out hopefully in February about this. So the cultivation uh, hazards are 
there's biological hazards like mold, there's chemical contaminants like pesticides, metals, and carbon monoxide. There's electrical fire hazards, which are, can be quite spectacular um, in a bad, totally bad way. Uh, and there's also radiation hazards, which um, are more in the occupational sphere, but can also happen in the home as well. In the processing phase, those environmental health risks kind of focus around the solvent extraction, uh, which is the, the production of something called hash oil, which we will talk about in depth today, um, which has, carries the risk of explosions and burns, death, chemical con contamination is quite a serious problem. Uh, we'll also talk super briefly about testing and quality control, as well as um, I'll point you out some different resources for food safety, because food safety is not something that we can cover at this time. In the use phase, uh, we're looking at things like secondhand smoke and maintaining smoke-free public spaces, which is very important, but also here at the CCDC and the people who work at the Drug and Poison Information Center will tell you that um, there's some very important things to be learned about cannabis intoxication and poisoning as well. So I'll kind of really briefly go over that. So other things like the, the big major theme things, NBAs, problematic use, um, addiction, lack of therapeutic options are not something I'll be covering today. So, um, just a note on the extent, scale, and conditions of cannabis cultivation. I've kind of alluded that there's many different settings that this can happen in. So the commercial operations already exist. Uh, they're, they're pretty large scale. They're supporting the medical marijuana um, or medical cannabis uh, users out there currently. However, after legalization, there's probably going to be uh, different sets of cultivator licenses, micro, micro cultivators and large scale cultivators. And so that, that will be happening, everything from like kind of craft level <laughs> cannabis cultivation to this massive facility that just opened a few months ago in Alberta, where they literally, it's the size of 16 football fields and it produces 100,000 kilograms of cannabis a year. So it is truly industrial scale cannabis. Um, <clears throat> so these facilities are, they are regulated, are regulated, tightly regulated facilities. They are subject to Health Canada mandated good production practices. Uh, there's seed to sale tracking, there's inspection, and of course there's testing. And the testing is getting uh, tighter as time goes on. Uh, those will be the tightest regulated and you would think the, the least thing that you have to worry about. Uh, on the other hand, we are also going to be legalizing personal cultivation. And this is where there's a lot of um, controversy, especially within uh, public safety and law enforcement people, <clears throat> and, and I suppose also some public health people as well, is that every uh, household will be allowed to have up to four budding plants. And the height restriction, there used previously a 100 centimeter height restriction placed on that, that's been removed. So now we're talking about four mature cannabis plants, which can be very large. And I'll explain why that's important in a little bit. Um, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police have come out and said that this is incredibly difficult to regulate. Um, there's a variety of reasons, and I really encourage anybody who is interested to read their brief to the House of Commons hearing. Uh, it's really interesting, but their, their general message that they have for the public and for regulators is that the likelihood of overproduction is really high because they have very limited ability to enforce this plan. So there's also, when we're talking about home growers, there's very limited guidance on how to grow, process, and dispose of bad cannabis safely. So we, we have not taught people how to grow cannabis, and if we don't show them the safe way to do it, then they will learn from the illicit world. Um, the other thing is that uh, hazardous, licit, and illicit grow-ups are not going away. So you can dial so using your Skype set, Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> Mute! <laughs> Please. Um, all right. So these illicit grow-ups are not going away, and they will continue to be a hazard for first responders and other people. All right. So... <clears throat> Just to jump right into the cultivation side of things, there's a number of pests and biological contaminants that are found on cannabis, and some of them are human pathogens, but a lot of them aren't. Okay, so just like any other gardener in any other garden, people who grow cannabis have to deal with insects like spider mites and aphids. And so they are not the health issue, but the pesticides applied to control them, maybe. And we're gonna talk about that a bit later. Uh, there's also uh, phytopathogens. There's, these are uh, pathogens that attack living plants. There's about 90 fungi that attack uh, cannabis, and this includes all the molds and mildews and blights that can basically sweep through a, green, a sea of green very, very quickly and take out an entire crop. And so this is a, an issue for, uh, again, pesticide use and what people will be willing to do to try to control this problem. 
Um, generally, uh, these phytopathogens, these are plant pathogens, so they don't generally affect humans, except in very extreme cases where you have uh, organ transplant recipients or chemotherapy patients where they're very immunocompromised. They might have some sort of opportunistic infection, but mostly those phytopathogens just attack the plant. But there is some opportunity for bacterial contamination, and that's usually related to poor production practices. Like um, there was an outbreak related to, I think they were irrigating with like black water or something. Uh, there's been uh, fertilizing with raw manure, things like that. That can cause obviously a bacterial problem, but that is not something you would expect to see in a well-regulated commercial facility. Um, <clears throat> in Canada, however, we have a lot of unregulated production right now. And we don't really understand how that, the kind of microbiological contamination of those products. There's been some um, investigative reporting on it. There's a, a food safety scientist from Guelph who's done some work, and I'll be talking about him later. But um, generally, the, it's kind of poorly understood. So the, the major issue is really the, the fungi that attack the dead plants. So those are the saprophytes. And they are basically, they're active when the plant has already been harvested and it's either being dried or cured or stored. And so those are the things like aspergillus and penicillium <clears throat> and others. And so they can have, uh, sorry, they can, they can become, uh, or they can potentially infect humans. And uh, as well, you can have negative health effects from mycotoxins or aflatoxins from fungi. But I want to say this is not clear that these are a problem. I, I was not able to find any solid information on that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and these fungi down here, these are actually the reason why medical marijuana is currently uh, irradiated, and it's to kill, it's to control those guys more than anything. So, back to the production practices. Uh, humidity is a big issue with cannabis, um, both because uh, the poor humidity control can allow fungi and other microbes to flourish on the growing plant or on the dead plant, but also because it can create a mold issue in the home itself. Right? And uh, the grower may then use a variety of chemicals to try to control the issue. So the reason why there's so much humidity is that young cannabis plants are actually clones with very limited root systems. So you plant them and then you have to keep very high humidity until they can root themselves. So that might be as high as 70%. It kind of decreases over time. But then once they're mature, a mature, tall standing cannabis plant, it, it basically transpires all the water that's irrigated with. So a tall, uh, mature cannabis plant can put as much as 400 grams of water into the air every day. That's equivalent to about five to seven tropical house plants. So by the time you have four plants, you may be talking about like quite an addition to the moisture burden of your home. And in some homes, this is going to be just too much. So a lot of people say, well, there's a plant limit of four, four plants, and how can this really be a problem? But for humidity, we already have homes that have moisture control problems and indoor air quality problems, and so cannabis could exacerbate that. <clears throat> so another thing that people do is um, growers may try to seal the premises because they want to increase the moisture, or they may be trying to hide the odor or reduce the odor, uh, and so that can also obviously increase uh, moisture problems. And then finally, uh, in terms of the, the uh, Pathogens is just very densely packed, so whatever pathogen gets in there can just spread very quickly through all the plants, and that is a problem because, again, they may use a, a pesticide to try to control that indoors. Uh, the other issue is that cannabis has to be dried really slowly, so once you've harvested it and you're, you've hung it to dry or it's just being cured, you actually have to allow that process to occur over a long period of time so as not to destroy the flavor profile of the product. And this is very important. Like people are, don't generally just bake it in an oven. That, that would control some of the uh, microbiological problems, but it would kind of ruin the cannabis. So uh, people do tend to let this dry slowly, and that can give saprophytes a chance to really establish themselves. OK, so how many plants are too many? Luckily, somebody has actually done a little bit of work on this. Um, <clears throat> and so as we know, most Canadian homes are very winterized. They're very airtight and climate controlled, and so they have very low ventilation rates. And this is also a problem radon, because there's some radon people in the room. Um, and so because of that, even a few plants, these big, tall, mature cannabis plants, could create a moisture problem. So there's a paper from 2012. It was a modeling study, and they looked at typical housing stock across Canada, and they did some modeling based on uh, typical homes from Ottawa, Windsor, and Regina, where the Ottawa homes were quite, uh, they're from different climatic regimes, but also the Ottawa homes were newer and were much more airtight. 
and they looked at uh, estimated typical ventilation rates, and then they looked at what happened when you added a certain number of plants, and at what point the number of plants exceeded the ability of the home to ventilate. What they found was, uh, for the homes in Windsor, which was has a particular climatic regime, but they found that some homes could tolerate as few as four plants. Four plants was enough to cause a moisture problem. Up to more than 100 plants in others, fine. But many of the plants actually already had a moisture problem. <laughs> so many of the plants could, or many of the houses could actually handle zero plants. And so that's a big issue when we, we think about indoor air quality, which is already a problem and could be further exacerbated. So the question here is how are these cannabis plants going to affect um, respiratory health? It's not just the humidity, it's also allergy and asthma related to the mold. It could be opportunistic infections, but it's, it could also be um, uh, the, the plants themselves having mold and then releasing it into the air inside the home. So there's some, I think, air quality issues here, not related to secondhand smoke. We haven't even talked about that yet. Uh, and so then the next question is, what risks will people take to prevent their moldy cannabis? If they don't want to lose their investment. They don't want to lose all the time they put into these plants. So are they going to use uh, a potentially dangerous product to control it? So in Colorado, in the US, um, pesticides were actually and have been a, a very big problem. And this is because initially when they legalized, they didn't have good guidance on what pesticides to use. Um, and as a result of that, as time went on, they discovered that a lot of the products coming over that were on the shelves were actually quite contaminated. And there was very, very costly recalls. Uh, the state de or the um, Department of Agriculture in Colorado, yeah, uh, they actually had to do quite a lot of work figuring out, okay, what, what pesticides can we potentially allow? What classes of pesticides and what specific pesticides? Um, and which ones we don't want to see ever, ever, ever. And so they came up with a list, and they're mostly pretty innocuous, but they also do allow some pyrethins as a synthetic option, it's kind of the nuclear option if you're about to have a catastrophic loss of your plants as a commercial grower, then you can apply these pyrethins, and that will perhaps help you out. But because the Department of Agriculture is not, it's not the EPA, it's not a risk assessor, they can provide no guarantee of human safety. So there's a big caveat on all of this. Um, they also have a list of things that are just really not allowed, and one of the things that I want to direct your attention to is this thing called microbutanol, which is a real problem with cannabis because cannabis has a, it's quite susceptible to something called powdery mildew, and microbutanol is excellent for controlling powdery mildew, and it's also widely available in stores, so it's a bit of a problem I'll be talking about. And you can see over time, as they've applied these uh, requirements for pesticides, they seem to be learning. The number of recalls is decreasing, and that's great. So the key issues here are that, first of all, the cultivation conditions can make cannabis susceptible to these pests, and you may get uh, a total wipe out of a whole crop. So there's a really strong financial incentive for somebody to apply a, a nuclear option, uh, whether or not they're allowed to do it, just to save their investment. The second issue is that cannabis is prohibited federally in the US, so that means that there's no EPA involvement in assessing or registering or <coughs> labeling any of these project, products. So there's no guidance whatsoever on what pesticides may be specifically appropriate for cannabis. Um, in the absence of those guidances, the states have come up with a mishmash of different recommendations. Some have no regulations, no regulations some demand totally all organic. And uh, yeah, so Canada, or Canada, however, does not have that problem. So. Um, we are going to be, our pesticides here are going to be regulated at the federal level by Health Canada and the Pest uh, Management Regulatory Agency, PMRA. So currently, PMRA actually has about 20 pesticides that are registered for use on medical cannabis grown in commercial facilities. Okay, so that's a mix of oils, uh, salt, detergents, insecticidal soaps, and biologicals, which are the little bacteria that leave insecticidal endotoxins on the plant and then kill the, kill the bugs. However, there's no synthetics on this list. There's no, um, there's no pyrifins. There's, n there's nothing like there's no nuclear option in the case of a potential catastrophic loss. And so, I'll talk about this in a little bit. But there may have been some people who have broken some rules because of this. Um, the other issue with this list of 20 pesticides is not all of them are appropriate for home use. Some of them are very specifically for use in a commercial environment, where you have controlled entry, you have people using personal protective equipment, and you have higher ventilation rates in the facility than in a home. 
So yes, we do have 20 registered pesticides for cannabis, but they need to be looked at. And this may be happening within the PMRA, and I'm just not aware of it, but they need to be looked at, evaluated, and the labeling needs to be changed. So when people go to the store, they're not going to buy some of the inappropriate products, which I'll talk about next. So is pesticide contamination a problem in our medical cannabis in Canada? Um, it's, not, it's not a big problem, but it wasn't really being looked for that uh, assiduously previously. So there's been you know, eight to 10, I guess, recalls <coughs> over the last uh, couple of years. And so most of these have been fairly innocuous. So they're, they're type, type three, which means that they're unlikely to have adverse health effects. Um, one of the more serious ones was this one in November 2016 by this company called Metrum, where they actually found mycobutanol, which is a fairly not appropriate <laughs> um, compound, as well as pyrethrin. And it was later uh, revealed or alleged by the Globe and Mail that they were doing this on purpose. There was a whistleblower came before the company and said, yeah, whenever the Health Canada inspector showed up, we just took those containers and we put them up on the roof, and they just didn't need to know that we were using this. And it, it of course, showed up. Um, so, yeah, some of the other things that have shown up are um, just issues with potency, like underselling, people buying less less THC than they thought that they were, which is the, you know, just ripping off the consumer. Uh, piperonal butoxide is a synergist that's usually used with pyrethrin, so if you see that, then you know that they probably had pyrethrin on that as well. And, uh, yeah, there have been generally very few adverse reactions except for that one from Metrum, but I think that I read just recently that the um, one of the people affected by the Metrum recall has launched a lawsuit and is gathering together other people who also uh, were affected by that by that event. Okay. So some things have changed recently because of this. In August 2016, um, it was the government made it legal for the public to send their cannabis. To us. Previously, only registered producers could send their, can their cannabis to Health Canada approved labs. So by doing this, it allowed people who were even buying illicit cannabis to send their pot in and figure out what was actually on it. And so that actually led to um, three of the pesticide-related cannabis protocol or product recalls. Then in February 2017, Health Canada decided that they were going to start doing some random testing, and they found, again, more uh, pesticide violations, including this mycobutanol thing showing up. Uh, in May 2017, they actually added mandatory pesticide residue uh, testing to their uh, testing requirements for medical cannabis, which is great. And they're going to continue doing random checks. And then just a couple weeks ago, they noticed that, or they, they advised through the media that <coughs> if you uh, violate these rules, you're going to be paying a million dollars per violation for it. So maybe that will do something. Now, illicit cannabis is a totally different story because, of course, nobody's regulating that. And so it's really quite misleading because people will go to a dispensary, dispensary and buy medical grade, quote unquote, cannabis from, uh, that they, they, they believe is somehow regulated because it's medical grade, but of course it can't come from the medical producers. Medical producers can only sell directly to uh, medical users. So people are buying something that they, they don't know what it is. And, that's a problem because it could be grown by happy hippies living in a valley, all organic, and it's like super nice and stuff, but it's mostly grown by organized crime, and they have zero reason to use safe production practices. Um, so NCCH did a paper on remediating grow ups quite a few years ago, <laughs> and they, uh, they worked with an environmental um, remediation company here in Vancouver, and they provided data that showed that a variety, a wide variety of potentially harmful pesticides show up in former grow-ups all the time. Uh, so there's also been some investigative journalism, and I won't go into this, but they're basically they, they have found various contaminants on cannabis that has come from dispensaries, so I think it's an issue. Probably a much bigger issue than this because there's been so little work done to look at it. And then outside Canada, we also know that, uh, especially work from Europe, I think, uh, is that there's just ex extensive pesticide presence on plants as well as cultivation rooms. So it's not just the product that's being sold to people, but that space, whoever inhabits, inhabits, inhabits it next may be exposed as well. And finally, um, these residues in the, pest, in the cannabis, they don't disappear when you smoke them. Like when they go through the cone of ignition on the, uh, on the joint or in uh, whatever device you're using to, to burn them, 
they don't, they're not consumed by combustion. You are inhaling those. Like uh, about 60% of the residues actually inhaled into your body. Can I have a question? For the CDC marketplace, they're not representing accurate consumption. Yeah. So, and that, so are they reporting that it's lower than what it actually is? Yeah. Uh, there might have been one that was higher, but usually it's just much, much lower. Like 5% instead of 30%. So yeah, you look very angry by that. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> Chemical contaminants is not something that I talk about a lot right now because pesticides is kind of like the bigger deal, but you can get a bioaccumulation of heavy metals, whether those are naturally present or due to human, human emissions in uh, soil or fertilizers, the plant will bioaccumulate that. And so that's things like arsenic, mercury, cadmium, lead in the seeds, leaves, seeds, leaves and buds. So the buds are what we smoke, so that's probably the most important thing. Um, the mode of consumption is important here, so some of these metals are much more highly absorbed through the lung than through the gut. And also, there's been research that's shown that when people do deep inhalation, when they really, and they hold it, that's greatly increasing the amount of metal um, that they can receive, exposure that they can receive. Okay, so carbon monoxide is a really interesting. In the illicit world, uh, you, uh, some growers will use CO2 enrichment in the grow space uh, to promote plant growth and increase the yield. So CO2 is just like the, the carbon source for the plant, and if you up the CO2, the plant is going to grow taller and have bigger flowers. So they try to get it up around 1,200 to 1,500 ppm, which is not, it's like, that's like a stuffy room that's not harmful to anybody. The harm comes from how the CO2 is generated. So. The CO2 can be generated by like, like cylinders of CO2, it can be generated through chemical reactions, like that's the most innocuous way, but it can also be generated by installing ignition devices like propane burners inside an indoor space where people may be sleeping, as well as um, taking the venting from the furnace or from the water heater and directing it into the growth space. And so these are obvious issues for carbon monoxide. So they're trying to get the CO2 but they might also be getting carbon monoxide. <laughs> um, I've done a little bit of digging on this, and it's actually very hard to find information about how prevalent this is. Um, the ignition devices themselves, the CO2 generators, um, they are widely available online. You can buy them on Amazon if you want, um, because they can be used in greenhouses, like not in an occupied space. So it's kind of hard to ban them as well. They're, they do have legitimate uses. Um, so we don't really know if they're a problem or not, or a problem relative to other uh, causes of carbon monoxide in the home that results in death. So something that, if anybody has information on that, I would be very interested to hear. So physical hazards are things like um, fires and shocks. So in the illicit world, of course, there's a lot of this kind of um, tampering of the home systems, uh, especially uh, electrical hazards related to just improperly installing equipment, putting the high wattage grow lights use a lot of power. And they can draw more power than your, your house's wiring can withstand. And so uh, they may do that and or they may tamper with the um, electrical supply to bypass the meter so they don't have to pay for it. Um, there's been cases where people have bypassed the gas meter so that they can run ignition devices inside the home, which has resulted in an explosion. Uh, so there's like a lot of these kind of like shady practices in the illicit world that one hopes will not transfer into the illicit world. Okay. However, uh, the a group uh, in which participates the uh, fire chief of Surrey, Len Garris, they actually found uh, some of the medical uh, grow-ups that they inspected in the city of Surrey were using some of the same really potentially dangerous uh, practices that the illicit grow-ups were using. So even with legalization, it's not clear that people will do the right thing and they'll follow those fire codes, follow the electrical codes, building codes, and, and do things safely. Um, so the fire hazards are really related to the hot lamps, the electrical draw overloads, and during an actual fire, once a fire actually breaks out, that fire can be a little bit more dangerous than normal fire simply because you may have compressed gas, you may have a propane cylinder in there, you may have butane in there or fertilizers or pesticides, and there's also um, obstacles inside the home. So if you've got this sea of green type cultivation where it's just a bunch of plants and sometimes the plant pots are on casters so that they, they, they roll around, it, it can be very hazardous for uh, first responders to go in there, both for them and they may not be able to rescue the grower either. Okay, so 
the UV hazard is something that I had assumed was just for the commercial world, but it turns out it's also in the personal cultivation world as well. So grow lamps, generally, they, they do produce a little bit of UV. And uh, you may also find people using dedicated UV devices for specific reasons. So using a lot of UVA or UVB uh, can help to increase the plant's THC content. And there's actually a really interesting reason why, but we don't have time to get into that. They may also be using UVC for pathogen control. So this is like the higher energy, very, very high energy UV that could be in, um, generally in the commercial environment, it's inside quite like a, in a closed box and the air flows through. UV hits it, it kills all the pathogens and then clean air flows out. But in the home, what people might do, as kind of mentioned at the bottom here, is they want to try UVC on their grow. They may buy a UV bulb and then tamper with it in order to get more UVC out of it. So, this is a, a big risk for skin and eye damage, of course, if you don't know what you're doing because you can have incident light and not realize that you're being badly burned before you are badly burned. Uh, so <clears throat> a little bit of, uh, not a lot of data on this, but a bit of preliminary research from the University of Washington found that uh, for the commercial grows in Washington, there was higher intensity UV light in nurseries versus in growth rooms. So there was, there was UV in all the rooms, but especially in the nurseries. And that if a worker was working for eight hours in the nursery, he or she would actually exceed the threshold limit value for UV by about ninefold. And so what this is saying is that occupationally, those workers probably need some sort of protection. Um, there's a, a great paper here, this German paper about you know, it's not just um, UV. There's other types of personal protective equipment for other hazards within an occupational setting that people may wish to uh, look into. And in fact, I think I saw a, a advertisement for a series of courses that are being held in Ontario in the near future about occupational cannabis. So if people are interested in that, I could forward that to them. And as I mentioned, at home, people could be also tampering with the lamps, which is just nuts that it can happen. Especially if you have, uh, you don't have a properly contained, secured grow space inside your home and you have people wandering in and out, being exposed to the light, that could be a problem. So this is a, obviously a commercial grow space and this gentleman here is tending to the plants and you can see he's got sunglasses on which is really good um, and he's got long sleeves on which is kind of good but the, his head and his neck are not protected. Also the sleeves that he's wearing are not for UV protection. They're actually because the, the buds are very sticky they have like a resin on them. The resin's where the THC is and so you don't want people's hair to adulterate the bud. <laughs> so he's not wearing that to protect himself, he's wearing that to protect the cannabis. All right, so that's, um, I'm probably just way over time, but so I'm not doing too bad. Um, so the next thing I want to talk to you about is the processing, and I'm going to mostly focus on the hash oil extraction. Uh, so solvent extraction is uh, basically using really flammable solvents to extract all the cannabinoids out of the plant material and then those solvents get purged by heating. So if that heating occurs in an uncontrolled manner, boom, that's what's happened to this condo building here. So uh, um, solvent extraction is causing everything from property damage to severe burns to death. There have been a number of deaths because of this. <clears throat> There's also an issue of poisoning from the residual solvents. So many different solvents are used. And if you don't do a good job purging it, then whoever consumes that concentrate is also consuming solvent. Um, some, some of the solvents, like, are, we're talking about things like butane, propane, isopropyl alcohol, hexane, toluene. So these are not great things to be putting in your body. Uh, and then finally, if somebody has used a pest control product on it that is you know, potentially dangerous, that process of making a concentrate also concentrates the pesticide. So there's a number of different risks that come from this. So in the U.S., uh, research has shown that decriminalization and legalization were associated with increases in explosions and injuries. So in Colorado, there were 29 series burns over this time period, and in California, there were about 100 series burns. So these are burns requiring hospitalization, right? This is not explosions. So there were many more explosions than this, but uh, these were the burns that actually wound up, people wound up being in hospital for extended periods of time. So this is based on National Burn Center data. The uh, data from the National Fire, the U.S. National Fire database is a little bit more difficult to access. But uh, in any case, um, 
this is up until 2014, so over 2015 to 2016, both California and Colorado enacted very serious penalties for hash oil extraction, things like, uh, you know, seven or eight years in jail, $750,000 fine, it's, it's serious, they're, they're felony, felonies, so uh, they've really, they're trying to come down hard on hash oil, but it's yet to be seen whether or not uh, the data will follow. Okay, so solvent extraction or hash oil production or concentrate production is also happening in Canada. Uh, concentrates are widely available online and in stores. You can you can buy them. They're everywhere. Um, and the hash oil explosions are also happening. So in uh, BC, there's been about 36 hash oil ex explosions that the uh, fire department had to respond to from 1996 until present. So hash oil extraction has been around for a long time. But with YouTube, <laughs> now anybody can learn how to do it. The good thing is that most YouTube videos are, are pretty, like, upfront about the risks. Like they do say, you know, don't do this inside your kitchen, do this outside to try to reduce some of those kaboom risks, but it still happens. In Ontario in the last five years, there have been um, about 30 incidents, and actually half of the incidents in BC also happened in the last five years. So this is like an accelerating type issue. Something that public health people don't often talk about, and I think it's really important for us all to understand, is why people do this. They know it's dangerous. They're not stupid. They know butane is explosive. And so why on earth would they ever do this? And there's, there's two reasons. The first one is that concentrates uh, are, are different. They are, they're very potent. They have about 60 to 90 percent THC. But it's not just about getting really high really fast. It's a different experience. So it's a, a, a diff very different feeling. Uh, there's very different organoleptic properties, so there's like a different taste and mouthfeel and smell. And there's a whole connoisseurship that has risen up around um, <clears throat> these products. So people who are seeking, <laughs> I'm getting some weird looks from in the room right now, and I just want to assure everybody that no uh, babies were harmed in this case. <laughs> but um, basically the point is, is that somebody who's looking for a cannabis concentrate is not going to be satisfied with substitutes because it's just fundamentally different than eating a ton of brownies. Um, the other really important thing to understand is that hash oil can be made from the waste product. Okay? So the, the best hash oil, again, weird looks, the best hash oil comes from the flowers, but um, if you're a grower and you've grown your four plants and you've got your little flowers hanging up and then you look down and you're like, hmm, look at all this plant material I have left. Am I going to throw this out or am I going to try to get a little bit something extra? from all my work. Well, it's very, very easy to go to Costco and buy a, a 24 pack of butane canisters and make some BHO. Um, <clears throat> so will legalization exacerbate this problem in Canada? Um, not sure, but there's three things it's probably dependent on based on what we've seen in the States. The first one is the access to the raw material. So not just having personal cultivation, but personal cultivation limits. So some people say that in, in Colorado, the big issue was that um, their personal cultivation limit was 99 plants initially. And they've since decreased that to 12 plants, which is still a lot of plants. So the, the more raw material people have access to, the more likely they're going to be to try to try something like this. The other thing is um, access to legal concentrates and penalties. So um, speaking to some colleagues from Washington, I was really interested to hear that they, they have very few hash oil explosions, very few. And it's because They've never allowed, they have recreational marijuana, but they've never allowed personal cultivation, just for medical users, but never personal recreational. They have penalties in place, bans in place, and they, they also have always had access to legal concentrates. So fewer explosions. Are these things connected to each other? Perhaps. So it's, it's hard to say what will happen here in Canada. <clears throat> so testing and quality assurance is, uh, there's a, a big section on it in the proposed regulations from Health Canada if you're interested in reading it, but uh, basically it's, it's based on the medical marijuana guidelines or regulations and they're going to be applied to nurseries, cultivators and processors when legalization occurs. So every lot or batch will have to be tested for microbial like, chemical contaminants, solvent rev residues if they're used for that particular product that's made, all the cannabinoids as well as the unauthorized pesticides. The facility will also have to employ a quality assurance person, which is important because like the different uh, standards and limits for all these different um, uh, contaminants is it's a little bit tricky to understand. They also need to have a recall system in place, and processors will have to hold on to a sample for a year. 
they'll have to bank that for a year in order to be checked potentially. And labs will need an analytical testing license. The issues with this are whether or not the medical testing requirements are sufficient or appropriate for the non-medical system and the products, especially the concentrated. <coughs> An illegally used pesticide might be undetectable on the plant, uh, but it could be hazardous in the concentrate if it's concentrated. Um, whether or not there will be sufficient lab capacity in place is another great question. There are a lot of producers uh, submitting applications. Um, so there's a lot of potential testing to be done, and I, I don't know if there's enough lab capacity. Um, these uh, production facilities, as I've mentioned, are enormous, and it's not clear whether or not those operations are going to be um, compliant with the uh, pesticide requirements. And finally, how do you know what pesticides to test for? There's hundreds of pesticides that can be used on cannabis inappropriately. And so uh, it's a question of uh, figuring out which ones are most common and should be looked for. Can you, can you comment on the potency of medical versus recreational? Why didn't you comment on it, Anne-Marie? <laughs> um, the medical marijuana has a much lower, or often much lower potency than recreational. So often we think of medical grade as higher, but it, in this case, it's a less potent compound. So the testing requirements also need to reflect the fact that this product will be much stronger for recreational use. Although some people have brought up this idea of having uh, different categories of recreational products. We have some really low potency recreational products for all the noobs who don't need to be laid out flat for two days because they tried something that they were not ready for. The medical has, has no THC in it. So what they use is epilepsy. So it, it has a different compound than the recreational. Okay, so food safety is something that NCCH is very, very interested in, but it has been kind of backburnered because, you know, there's like enough on people's plates right now just trying to deal with what's going to be legal potentially this year as opposed to what might come later. So Lorraine's shaking her head because this is something that's going to be coming back to you at some point. But um, some of the general classes of concerns are really the basic like food preparation and handling stuff. Um, the packaging and labeling. Um, concerns get a lot of attention, so having a, a limit of how much THC you can have per serving, childproof packaging, obvious labeling, so thing with this uh, Nugtella <laughs> product up here, this gives me shivers, because if I saw this in a cupboard, I would e be eating tablespoons of this before realizing what it was, I would never see, I would never see that, it, it's obviously Nutella, I would eat that, and so this is like terrible, so this should never ever be left. I think this was in um, a medical marijuana market, and they pulled it because it was just clearly ridiculous. The other thing is having um, Colorado's done things like you're not allowed to have animal fruit or cartoon shapes because they're appealing. So in Canada, I think the wording is especially appealing to children. You can't have anything that's appealing. But in generally, the packaging, like, it, okay, <laughs> the cannabis thing at the top there has plain packaging, which is good, I guess, but the actual shape of the thing is undistinguishable from the the candy. The candy and the cannabis gummy are indistinguishable from each other. So this is clearly um, <coughs> a problem. Also, the food safety world, uh, there's a lot of work being done on like the traceability and understanding how that works in the US. Um, if you want to have a, a really great discussion about uh, food safety, Public Health Ontario put on this webinar uh, I think it was in 2016 by Dr. Keith Warner from uh, University of Health, and it's actually very, very good. I highly recommend you see it because I don't have time to talk about all this. Um, okay, finally, to use. So the biggest issue with use that everybody's worried about is secondhand smoke and vaping and maintaining smoke-free public spaces. So this is kind of frustrating for public health because we've put so much effort into having these smoke-free public spaces, and it kind of feels like cannabis is going to upend that to some degree. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, interest in where different jurisdictions allow you to use cannabis. So obviously most places anti-smoking laws apply. If you can't smoke there, can't smoke tobacco there, you can't smoke pot there. But um, I've noticed looking across the different um, <coughs> documents that have come out from the provinces that the wording is very different. Like some are saying no public parks, and others are saying no public parks where children could be present. And so there's, I don't understand that enough to comment on it, but it, there could be some interesting differences. Um, in Colorado, there's nothing, no smoking allowed in public parks, 
and in fact, if you take your your cannabis to the ski hill, you'll be going to jail because that's federal land. It's not state land, and so you've just created a committed a felony by taking your cannabis to the ski hill. In any case, uh, there's also a lot of discussion about these restricted access clubs and cafes. Even here in, in Canada, some jurisdictions are, are considering them and private property. So private property is the best place that you'll be able to consume cannabis. In Colorado, that's been a little bit of a trouble, a problem, because they've said you can only consume on um, <coughs> private property. And so all these cannabis tourists were coming to Colorado and buying cannabis, and then they couldn't consume it anywhere. They can't consume in their hotel room or anywhere else if they didn't have access to like a friend's house or something. So the solution to that was these pot party buses. <laughs> where they, could, they can tour around and smoke as much cannabis as they want <laughs> on these mobile venues. So this is, yeah, apparently there was just recently for New Year's, I think there was some like CNN reporter was on a pot party bus in Colorado and she was like smoking joints and getting totally crazy as she was on the air. <laughs> um, okay, so the bigger issue for most people is, is really about the private residences and the residential buildings. And the concern there is second and third hand smoke as well as odors, okay? So there's things that you can do in multi-residential buildings about, about smoke because we know smoke is a health hazard. And so cannabis smoke is the same. It's a health hazard. You can force people to do stuff about that to some extent. Odor is more difficult because odor is also perceived as being like directly harmful. Like if I can smell cannabis from production, not the smoke, the growing cannabis, does that mean that I'm getting a dose of THC? You know, so this is kind of like the, the confusion that the public has. And so odor issues are probably going to be very difficult to deal with. <laughs> there are some technological solutions for that, however. Okay, so last thing, poisonings. Um, the population <coughs> here are, are children's, children's, lordy, children, naive users, and pets. Um, a lot of dogs. Uh, dogs actually are more, much more likely to die from consuming cannabis. They're, they don't respond well to it at all. Uh, the data sources for these are things like emergency department visits and hospitalizations and calls to poison control centers. So in the U.S. National Poison Data System, they've seen a big increase in child poisonings year over year related to edibles, but also to non-edibles. So in one study that I read through, a kid was as likely to have consumed an unfinished joint as they were to have consumed a cookie or like some sort of edible. And the reason why, there's lots of reasons why it could be. One, one reason, one speculation is that they were eating hash a lot. And hash, when it's just like crumbled on the table, it kind of looks like chocolate. And so they might have mistook it for, for an edible. But the other possibility is that parents are just much more careful about their cookies. They put the cookies away, but they leave the joint in the ashtray thinking, oh, Little Billy's never going to touch that. And then, boop, little kid eats it and winds up in the ER. So here in BC, the Drug and Poison Information Center is doing a project, which I don't know enough details to talk about, but they are collecting uh, cannabis calls. I think they have like 900 calls or something over the last five years related to uh, you know, cannabis intoxication, who's doing it, how are they doing it, and I'm sure some very interesting results will eventually be made public from that. Uh, this picture is from last Halloween. Uh, for the first time ever, the mythical somebody handed out cannabis gummies to children thing actually happened, but it was obviously a huge mistake. They handed out a, an open package, and the police got a hold of it, and went to the person, and they were obviously, it was a mistake. They didn't mean to do that. They were probably high, but uh, you know, this is something that parents always talk about. Oh, what if my child gets cannabis gummies? Well, it actually happened this time. It's quite funny. So. There was no no child consumed any, there was no child harm from that either. <laughs> so what can we do about these risks? Um, the most important thing obviously is evidence-based policy and legalization is actually necessary to facilitate that research. So we're kind of like learning as we're going here. Um, knowledge translation and public education obviously is very important. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of campaigns going on across Canada right now, a lot of work being done on this specifically right now. Um, health surveillance, whether through things like the poison control centers or other mechanisms. Um, we've submitted a, a proposal for a symposium for CPHA this year that is going to have a, kind of a discussion about health surveillance and data collection for cannabis policy. And hopefully it will get accepted. I'll let you know how that goes. Um, tools for PHIs and EHOs. And then finally, doing it all again to gear up for edibles and cannabis concentrates potentially in 2019. So 
and CACH is doing some stuff on this. We've developed a topic page. It's a web page with just resources for environmental health practitioners. And there's everything on there from like inspection resources to some really high level good summaries of health effects to uh, just different papers from different jurisdictions kind of as learning tools. We also have, similar to this one, we have a webinar that's specifically on risk messaging, which is on that topic page. We're also hopefully putting out a paper in February called Growing at Home, Health and Safety Concerns for Personal Cultivation. So it summarizes a lot of the stuff that I've said here with a lot more detail, but it also talks more about the kind of policy and regulatory options for perhaps abating some of those risks, as well as it provides really specific uh, suggestions for messaging. So, you know, make sure people in your community understand that just because a pesticide can be used on strawberries does not mean that you can use it on cannabis. It can't be inhaled. Like, stuff like that, like things that are, are very directed at the public. Uh, so, my, my manager isn't here, is she? Otherwise, she'd be shooting daggers at me. No, she's not. So, potentially, February or March, we'll be doing an e-news. Uh, and NCCH knows just on cannabis and kind of putting all these resources together. So stay tuned for that. But no guarantees on when that's coming. Um, finally, I'm clearly not going to be around for very much longer, but my other cannabis team members are here in the room. It's Dr. Amory Nickel right here who asks the leading questions. And uh, Leela Steiner, who's my mat leave replacement. And they will be um, taking, taking this work on. All right, so what else can we do, you do right now? One of them is like just get in contact with NCCH. So this growing at home paper, um, the policy options are quite difficult. Uh, there's not a lot of um, background material out there, and so I'm always interested in hearing suggestions and ideas or innovative practices. Um, so we're looking for input on that. It's actually in review right now. See what happens. The other thing is to get involved in the Health Canada consultation. So you have until January 20th to submit an online questionnaire or written submission about their proposed regulations that are everything from licensing to uh, good production practices to tracking to security clearances. It's, it's a big document, but if you have a particular thing that you're really interested in, you can find that section and you can provide input on it. It's, it's very useful to them. All right, that's all for now. My email address is up there, Anne Marie's and Leela's. And I think we have time for some questions. Oh, six minutes. Sorry, guys.